Welcome back to part two of the case of the Shafia family. If you haven't watched part one, I'll leave a link to that video in the description box down below. On June 30th, just hours after the Nissan sank, Hamid called the police from Montreal. He called to report a single car fender bender in an empty parking lot near the house. Had uh, an accident uh, on San Yonas. Uh, are you in church? Uh, no, no, just uh, car damage. Oh, okay, how many cars are involved? Uh, one, it's uh, with the pool. He told the responding officer that he accidentally smashed the left front end of the Lexus into the yellow guardrail. Montreal Constable Natalie Ledeau was dispatched to the parking lot and arrived around 8.03 a.m. The left headlight was smashed and the officer could see that the damage matched up with the height of the barrier. Although the officer was confused why Hamid chose to park where he did. I think in his mind he thought he was creating an alibi, when all he really did was draw attention to himself. At 8.30 he phoned the Kingston East Motel and spoke to his father. Then he dialed Sahar's cell, knowing full well it was submerged in the Rideau Canal. And when the call went straight to voicemail, he phoned again. At this point, Hamid was driving back to Kingston in the family's green Pontiac minivan. He was in such a rush to switch cars and stage a fake car accident that he took everyone's luggage, including his mother's purse, back to Montreal. Around the same time that morning, staff at the Kingston Mills Lock Station found a car underwater about six and a half feet and supported by the outside of the upper lock gate. They figured it was most likely stolen and dumped there, or it could have been a prank. At first glance, the car was seen more as a nuisance, not a crime scene. But when they saw the position the car was in, they knew something was wrong. How did the car even get in there? To arrive in that area, the car would have had to have been driven around a winding S-shaped course, then around a lock station and past a large rock outcropping. Scratches were found along the edge of the stone lock wall. The car had to be maneuvered over the edge of the wall and between the wood steps of the lock gate, an area only a few meters wide. Around the rock outcropping, there was a faint black skid mark on the edge of the curb. And behind the outcropping on the lawn, there were two pieces of clear plastic. In the meantime, a dive team entered the water to inspect the vehicle. They noticed large prominent dents and scrapes along the driver's side, and the driver's side window was also rolled all the way down. The divers looked in the car and found a horrific discovery. A woman's body was floating in the water, and another was spotted further inside the vehicle. John Moore, one of the divers, described the body as being in the dead man's float. This was no prank, possibly a tragic car accident or worse. Staff Sergeant Chris Scott took control of the scene and ordered the area secure to prevent contamination as this was a public tourist destination. Back at the motel, Hammond and his parents dropped the other children off at a nearby Tim Hortons and began the next phase of their plan to avert suspicion. They walked into police headquarters just after 12 noon. Hammond, if not all three of them, had been awake the entire night. Detective Constable Jeff Dempster was supposed to work the afternoon shift, but his cell phone rang a few hours early. He was told about the car full of bodies at the Kingston Mills locks and was asked to come in as soon as possible. A few minutes after he arrived at police headquarters, three people showed up at the front counter to file a missing persons report. Mohamed Shafia, Tuba Mohamed Yaya, and Hamad Shafia. Hamid did the talking while his father listened. He said his two sisters were missing and they were in a Nissan. When asked for more information, Hamid corrected himself and said that there were four people missing, three of his sisters and his father's cousin, who was about 50 years old. According to Hamid, the family was staying at the motel on Highway 15, and when they woke up, they found the car and the girls gone. Jeff Dumpster arranged for a Persian-speaking interpreter to come to the station and translate, and informed the Shafias that their family members were most likely deceased. He also knew that the next step would be difficult but necessary. 
He needed to question Mohammed, Hamid, and Tuba to gather as much information as possible about what happened the previous day. By noon, the number of confirmed victims was still two, and police at the Kingston Mills were told that the Shafias had filed a report for four missing family members and a missing Nissan Sentra. But the divers had only seen two bodies, so where were the other two missing people? Later in the afternoon of June 30th, Glenn Newell, a diver with the Ontario Provincial Police, confirmed the third and fourth body inside the vehicle. Quote, they were all piled on top of each other. It was very difficult to tell which person would have been driving the vehicle. The rear left window was down about one inch and the rear left taillight was damaged. The officer also noted that no objects inside the car, including cell phones and a blanket, had gotten outside, indicating that there wasn't much force created by the water entering the cabin of the vehicle, and estimated it would have taken several minutes for the car to completely sink. And the route the car had followed to end up where it did was becoming more confusing. They needed to determine right away if the green gate near where the car fell into the water could have been unlocked overnight. If it was open, it was possible that the car had gone through there if someone was joyriding and lost control of their vehicle. However, the staff were insistent that the gate was indeed locked. So many questions were raised. From the way the four bodies were positioned, it was difficult to tell who the driver of the car was. None of the women had been wearing seat belts. In 90% of dive recoveries, someone is seated in close proximity to the driver's seat area. But in this case, 13-year-old Gidi was the closest. It didn't make any sense. One by one, each body was removed from the Nissan. The first was 17-year-old Sahar. She was in the rear of the car, dressed in a pair of tight jeans and a sleeveless top. Her belly button was pierced and her nails were polished in two different colors, purple on her fingers and black on her toes. Zainab Shafia was found in the front passenger seat. Her face was slumped forward, her fingernails were painted a light shade of blue, and her black cardigan was on backwards. Gidi's body was found floating over the driver's seat, with one arm wrapped around the headrest, and the window beside her was wide open. Like Sahar, the big sister she idolized, Gidi also had a navel ring. Rona Amir Mohammed was slouched in the back seat, the girl's supposed aunt or cousin, but the police would soon learn that she was really Shafia's first wife he was trying to keep secret from the Canadian government. The day she drowned, Rona was wearing a blue shirt, three pairs of earrings, and six gold bangles. Back at the police station, Detective Jeff Dempster interviewed and videotaped Mohammed Tuba and Hamid Shafia. He was prepared to be empathetic as he assumed this was a grief-stricken family looking for answers. But almost immediately, he began to pick up discrepancies in their stories. He thought it was strange that Hamid referred to Rona as his aunt and Mohammed called her his cousin. The interview was also long and drawn out as Tuba and Mohammed needed a translator in the room who spoke Farsi, giving their answers back to Dempster in English. Shafia was calm and showed no emotion. He explained he had just returned from a business trip in Dubai two weeks earlier, and the family was taking a vacation to Niagara Falls. You know the car, your car, the Nissan was found underwater? Yes, I said that. Uh, yes, ha any thoughts, any idea how it got there? No. No. Okay. Throughout his interview, he was not behaving like a man who had just lost three daughters in a fatal car accident. He rambled on about his business in Dubai and how he planned to transfer his business dealings to Canada, and how he recently bought a strip mall in Laval for $2 million. In the beginning, the Shafia stories were essentially the same. The family of 10 were on a road trip to Niagara Falls. It was also pointed out that Hamid and Tuba were the only licensed drivers in the family. Shafia, Tuba, and Hamid also told the detective how they began their trip late in the evening. 
detouring to see downtown Toronto and the CN Tower, and then back to Highway 401 and a stop at McDonald's. And that they had stopped at a Kingston motel because Tuba got too tired. And that Zainab grabbed the car keys to retrieve some clothes. The next morning, the Nissan and nearly half the Shafia family were gone. According to Shafia, that was it for the story. He didn't know anything else. But that was hardly it, as the detective soon realized. The more questions that Dempster asked, the stranger their story sounded. Why would these women, after a six-hour drive from Niagara Falls, randomly jump into a car for a middle-of-the-night joyride? Why did an eyewitness tell police that he saw two cars at the water's edge that night? And why did the Shafias show up at the police station in a green minivan? Not the silver Lexus they were driving during the vacation. Shafia said they stopped in Kingston early that morning because his wife, who was driving the Nissan, was feeling dizzy and needed to sleep. So Tuba waited with the ones who are no longer, these are his words, not mine, while he and Hamid went searching for a place to sleep. When the Nissan rejoined them at the motel, Hamid left for Montreal to work on the building or something, and then everyone else went to bed. And that's when Zainab and Sahar asked for the car keys to retrieve some clothes from the trunk. But Dempster wasn't satisfied with these answers and kept peppering Shafia with questions. Where did they go in Toronto? Which McDonald's did they stop at? How did they communicate between the two vehicles while driving? And who was driving which vehicle on the approach to Kingston? This question would become one of the most confusing and frustrating questions to get the Shafias to answer. Also, where did Tuba wait while the Lexus looked for the motel? And how did she know where to meet them afterwards? The truth is, of course, that the Nissan waited at the locks parking lot and never made it to the motel. But in order to sell the ridiculous story to police, that Zainab, with no license and no permission, took the Nissan for a middle-of-the-night joyride, they had to say that the Nissan made it back to the motel. So when Dempster asked the simplest question, where did Tuba wait for the Lexus, Shafia couldn't tell him the truth. After the interview was over and he left the interview room, Shafia checked his watch. Hamid, age 18, didn't need an interpreter. He was fluent in English and Dari, and he looked like any other 18-year-old Canadian. Dempster asked Hamid the same question he asked his dad. Where did Tuba wait with the Nissan? His response, quote, I think it was a McDonald's or something. I'm not sure. Hamid, with not a tear in sight, told the detective that he didn't sleep at the motel with the rest of his family. Instead, he climbed back into the Lexus at 2 a.m., and drove back to Montreal, more than 300 kilometers away. Hamid's reasons ranged from, I forgot my laptop, to I needed something personal, to sometimes you just don't feel like staying at one place with your parents. And each new response only made Dempster more suspicious. He was apparently home only a few minutes when his dad called to tell him the girls were missing. Hamid, do you know what happened to your sisters? You don't? What if I told you that that same person also saw another vehicle, but that other vehicle drove away? And that it was a large vehicle? You mean someone pushed them in? No. Hamid, I think you know more than, than what you've told me here today. Dempster then told Hamid about an eyewitness, an eight-year-old boy as it turned out, who had spoken to investigators on the scene. According to his story, there were two cars at the water's edge, but only the bigger one drove away. When it was Tuba's turn to be interviewed, Dempster got right to the point and said to her that he was trying to understand how the Nissan got from the motel to the water. <laughs> According to Tuba, she was the one who drove the Nissan into Kingston, but was too tired and nauseous to go any further. 
She parked somewhere, but wouldn't specify the exact spot, and waited for the others to find a place to sleep, and said, quote, When they got to the motel, they wanted to come get me, but I came myself. She said she was changing for bed around 2 a.m. when Zainab walked in and asked for the car keys, and didn't understand what happened after that. Tuba, with her three daughters dead and her life supposedly destroyed, told her story as if only the car was lost. There were no tears and no emotion. But she did make sure to point out that her oldest daughter was in a hurry to get back to Montreal. Tuba even claimed that Zainab, who again didn't have a license, let alone highway driving experience, was begging to drive during the trip back from Niagara Falls. At 8.40 p.m., with the sun setting over the crime scene, Hamid was back in the interview room. By now, Kingston police had contacted Montreal police, and Dempster now knew about that single car smash up this morning. Hamid said he was on his way to grab some breakfast when he accidentally smacked the pole, and he just didn't want his father to find out until after everyone got home. As soon as Kingston police learned about Hammond's accident in Montreal, the same day that his parents reported Rona, Zainab, Sahar, and Gidi missing, they knew they had to get to Montreal to see the Lexus. After first getting Shafia's permission to view the Lexus without resorting to getting a search warrant. Later that day, police found the Lexus parked inside the garage, and what they discovered would turn out to be extremely valuable to their case. 10 pieces of plastic inside and around the vehicle. At Ottawa General Hospital, pathologist Dr. Christopher Milroy would be performing the autopsies on the four women found in the Kingston locks. He discovered several red and black bruises on the crown of Rona's head, covering six centimeters in diameter, saying it was a very substantial area of bruising and it could have occurred in one impact or it could have been the result of two impacts. Gidi had nearly identical bruises on her head. So did Zainab. Sahar was the only one without bruises to her head. According to the pathologist, quote, it was unusual that all three would have similar injuries. It clearly requires an explanation. That explanation would never happen but science could confirm three things for sure. The head injuries occurred while the victims were still alive, the official cause of death was drowning, and there were no drugs or other paralyzing substances found in the woman's blood. Were they knocked unconscious before the water filled their lungs? Did they actually drown in the canal or somewhere else beforehand? Were they dead or alive when the Nissan sank? According to Milroy, the pathology was neutral. He couldn't say for sure. But outside the autopsy room, investigators were piecing together other important clues, quite literally. The day the bodies were found, while Hamid was dodging questions about his parking lot accident, Constable Rob Etherington noticed something near the locks. Tiny shards of broken plastic, seven pieces in all. The next afternoon, with Shafia's permission, Police drove to Montreal to see the mysterious SUV with their own eyes. In the trunk, they found more bits of broken plastic. These ones obviously were from the dented front end, which of course Hammond blamed on the yellow post. But each fragment of plastic found in the locks, and each one from the Lexus, fit together like a puzzle. Clearly the Nissan had not been alone by the water that night. The pieces of plastic were sent to the Center of Forensic Science Crime Lab in Toronto, where it was confirmed that the pieces from Montreal and Kingston Mills were once part of the same vehicle. The investigation, just 72 hours old, was now a homicide file, though police didn't make that information public right away. Police had already begun to gather and analyze the cell phone data that would piece together the Shafia's movements between June 23rd and 30th, from Montreal to Niagara Falls, back to Kingston. The examination of those cell records were telling. On June 27th, while the family was in the middle of their vacation at Niagara Falls, Hammond's phone registered at a cell phone tower at West Brook, just west of Kingston. Police and prosecutors concluded that Hammond and Mohammed must have traveled back to Kingston Mills to plan the murders. 
In the meantime, Shafia and Tuba were trying to gain public sympathy by granting tearful interviews to the media. That sympathy would be short-lived because detectives were quietly learning the truth about life inside their home. Kingston police had begun receiving disturbing information from friends and family of the Shafias living in Montreal and Europe. Calls came in from Hussein Hidari, the Montreal man engaged to Zainab, Fazil Havid, Tuba's brother living in Sweden, Fahima Borgetz, the distant relative of Rona's and one of her closest telephone confidants, and Latif Hadare, Tuba's uncle in Montreal. Rona's sister, who was living in France, wrote, quote, We are convinced that this was a crime of honor, organized under the guise of Mr. Shafia, his wife Tuba, and their oldest son. And it wasn't long before the police knew about the whole twisted story. The 911 calls, the child welfare complaints, Zainab running away, Rona's true identity, Everything was starting to unravel. When investigators seized the Lexus on July 10th, they found two interesting photographs inside the console. Both were of Sahar's boyfriend. A week later, just 17 days after the women died, a judge authorized the use of wiretaps. In Canada, it's both illegal and unconstitutional to intercept private communications using wiretaps without first obtaining a warrant through the court. Kingston police invited Shafia, Tuba, and Hamid back to Kingston on July 18th, supposedly to return some belongings and update them on the investigation. While they were inside the station, cops asked the Shafias to leave their van unlocked in case it had to be moved. They did so and went inside the office. Meanwhile, the police were wiretapping their minivan. Before sending them home, Officers asked the Shafias if they wanted to go to Kingston Mills to see where their family members died. The Shafias agreed, following the police to the Kingston East Motel and walking them through what they thought happened. Police, of course, didn't believe their version of events, but played along with the Shafias' game for now. While at Kingston Mills, the Shafias were told by police that one of the canal buildings had a surveillance camera that was operating the night the vehicle went into the locks. This, of course, was a lie, but the Shafias didn't know that. And once they were back in the van and driving along the highway, Shafia started talking with the police eavesdropping. Then Shafia said, that night there was no electricity there. Everywhere was pitch darkness. This was more than speculation about what Kingston Mills might look like at night. Shafia was making a statement of fact. In one sentence, he confirmed he was there that night. And at one point, Hamid realized that maybe police were listening to them, saying to his parents that police can fasten something to record your voice. For the next four days, the Shafias would be monitored and recorded from a police center in Ottawa. Their conversations would be translated into English and carefully scrutinized by investigators. Police would record Mohammed Shafia discussing his surviving children wondering how they would prevent the other children from following the defiant footsteps of Zainab, Sahar, and Gidi. Shafia's anger consumed him. He felt like he was a good father. He cursed his dead daughters. In his eyes, they betrayed him. <laughs> As the police listened to these conversations, they grew concerned for the remaining children. If it only took the perception of bad behavior to get four family members killed, could it possibly also happen to the others? The next night on July 20th, Shafia continued telling himself he had done the right thing. <laughs> Shafia was offended by his daughter's behavior. This was personal to him. 
but his own words gave him away. Things were not looking too good for Shafia. It was becoming more clear that he conspired to kill his daughters because of his fragile ego. It came from Mohammed Shafia himself, repeated over and over again on wiretaps. By now, police had heard enough. The next afternoon on July 21st, officers arrived at the Shafia residence with a search warrant and child welfare workers. For their own safety, A, B, and C were removed from the home and placed in protective care. Hamid, Tuba, and Mohammed were ordered out of the house while police conducted a search inside. They were all told they were suspects in the murders, but police didn't arrest them that night. However, a listening device was planted in the house telephone. Detectives spent hours inside the house, cataloging and seizing potential pieces of evidence. They found multiple photos of Zainab, Sahar, and Rona inside the suitcase Hamid had taken to Dubai to meet up with his father. Taken into evidence were phone bills, passports, Rona's diary, the laptop, and Hamid's black suitcase, still packed with pictures of Sahar that he took to Dubai to show his dad. When police left, the Shafias were allowed back inside. What had been a family of 10, and then a family of six, was now down to three. The wiretaps were still rolling at 2.56 a.m. when Hamid's cell phone rang. On the other end of the line was his little brother, B. Quote, Look, Hamid, you're 100% caught. The next morning, a family friend picked up Hamid, Tuba, and Mohammed at their house. They were going to consult a lawyer about getting their children back. A Montreal police surveillance team was watching them as they left the house and drove off. The Shafias never made it to that lawyer's office. At a busy intersection, the vehicle was cut off and the arrests were made. The three were taken to a Montreal police station, charged and immediately transported to Kingston, three hours away. Among the officers waiting at the police station was Inspector Shaheen Medizadeh a Farsi-speaking Mountie based in British Columbia who was brought in for the sole purpose of interviewing husband and wife in their native tongue. By then, all three suspects had been separated. There were no more chances to talk things over and no more time to plot the next lie. Police would grill them for hours, confronting them with the overwhelming evidence and urging them to come clean. One would sort of crack, but the other two would stick to their story and then one of them would invent a completely new version of events, hoping to save all three. Tuba's interrogation with Shahin was intense. It began on July 22nd at 5.31 p.m. and didn't end until nearly 1 a.m. میخوای صادق باشی شروع کنی یه نو با من حرف بزنی دل تو خالی کنی من توی دلم فقط غم بچه ها دیگه چیز ندارم غم بچه ها دست کجا اومد من دلم چرا چرا باید تو دلت غم باشه واسه بچه ها هست مردن دیگه بلی کی ستاش مردن چرا مردن تبا چرا مردن چرا کشته شدن؟ علتش چی بود؟ چرا گذاشتی این اتفاق میفته؟ بهتون بگم که من من مطمئنم که شما میتونید چی شده؟ من مطمئنم که شما یه کارایی کردید، کمکایی کردید که این کار بکنید یا اینکه میدونید که چی شده؟ باور کنم اصلا اصلا من دی بارا نمیفهمیدم که شفی تصمیم میگیره که اینا رو بکشه باور کنید من براتون قسم میکنم نمیفهمیدم خانم خواهش یه جیت جی خواهش میکنم براتون دروغ به من نگید نه نه. بله شما پارک بودید پارک بودید اوکی بگو مگم یه خواهش هستان میکنم که به شوهر هیچ وقت نگوین من به شوهرتون این چیز رو نمیگم من این 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 مربوط به شوهر شما نیستش این, این مربوط به شماست نه به شوهرتون آه. به شوهر من این نگوین که من اینطوری گفتم این نه خانو من قول میدم He told her We know what has happened now but we want to know why Why have four lives been lost He showed Tuba a picture of Kingston Mills 
and asked if she remembered stopping there on the way to Niagara Falls, and asked about June 27th and why Hammond's cell phone was in Kingston that day while the rest of the family was still in Niagara Falls. She said Mohammed was gone and most likely took Hammond's phone with him. He told her about the van wiretaps and how she had already incriminated herself, placing them at Kingston Mills prior to the deaths, and also pointed out how ridiculous it would be for Rona, who was more than 50, to go out on a joyride at two in the morning. Hour after hour, Tuba cried and denied and insisted that no mother could commit such an act. But the more Shahin suggested Hamid was the killer, the more her story shifted. Tuba then admitted in the video interrogation that one of her brothers had told her about Shafia saying he wanted to kill Zainab. This was a huge breakthrough. Tuba placed herself at the Kingston Mills that night. Sitting in the car with the four women and waiting for her husband and Hamid to return. She claimed she fell asleep in the Lexus, but then described a scene that police believe might have occurred. Some form of pre-drowning of the women at the basin below the top lock. She appeared to be telling the story of the murders cautiously, without implicating herself. She went on to explain that Shafia was alone with the Nissan at the water's edge and that she and Hamid were across the road with Alexis. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, they heard a splash. And they both ran and saw the Nissan was in the water. She also acknowledged that the Lexus was also at the end of the lock where the Nissan fell in, but couldn't explain how it got there. And at that moment, she became so stressed that she fainted. When she came to, she was back at the motel. Tuba said Shafia drove to the Kingston East Motel and Hammett helped her to her room. But Shahin went back to the scene at Kingston Mills. He wasn't going to let this go. He questioned the family's actions that day. Hammett driving to Montreal apparently for his laptop and the rest of them going to bed at the Kingston East Motel and not calling the police. Tuba's response was to defend Hammett, saying maybe he didn't have his cell phone. The day after the interrogation, Tuba informed police that she was recanting everything she told Shahan. At 11.25 p.m. on July 22nd, about 12 hours after being arrested, Hamid was brought into a nearby interview room and met with Detective Steve Koopman. Hamid said he and his father checked into the motel and went back up the road to find his mother and sisters and Rona. But the Nissan was already driving towards them and Hamid couldn't explain how this happened. He said he was only at the motel for five or ten minutes when he decided to leave for Montreal. This time he had a different excuse. He wanted to check on a building they owned in the city. After about an hour, Koopman excused himself from the room and then returned a short while later. He told Hamid that he was no longer asking if he and his parents killed the women. Police wanted to know why they did it, and Hamid didn't have an answer. He then asked Hamid why pieces of the Lexus headlight were found at Kingston Mills, and accuses Hamid of staging the accident in Montreal to cover up the damage from using the Lexus to bump the Nissan into the locks. I think what happened is that, is that unfortunately I think the car got stuck up on the ledge and that you guys had to use the vehicle to get that car over and into the water. And that's caused the damage to the Lexus. You're in the middle of the night. You can't see every piece of plastic that's broken off that thing. And now you need to get that vehicle out of Kingston because it wasn't part of the plan. Because before that, it would just simply be the Nissan slipped into the water. And now you've got the other vehicle with some unexplained damage that could be linked to the Nissan and now uh, you've got to get that back to Montreal. But then you realize getting it back to Montreal still may not be enough. We have to account for why the damage is done to that vehicle. And you guys did a good job. Shafia was interrogated on July 23rd. Dressed in the same pants and sandals from the day before, he said his arrest was a violation of his rights and his life was ruined. And that the person who really killed his family should be found and punished and then complained that someone had likely called the police to accuse him of killing Zainab, saying it was probably her boyfriend. 
Shahin made it clear that the police didn't believe the deaths were accidental and showed Shafia the information from the cell phone records, showing that someone had traveled to the Kingston region on June 27th in the middle of the Niagara Falls vacation. Shafia, though, admitted to nothing. He was told about the wiretap recordings. He was told about the broken pieces of headlight from the Lexus. Shafia's response was to say that was impossible, not once, but twice. Shafia denied everything. He denied beating his children. He wouldn't even admit that Rona was his wife, even though their wedding photo was in the inspector's hands. Four months after the arrest, an envelope arrived at police headquarters. The Shafia case, twisted enough already, was about to take a very weird turn. The package was from Musa Hadi, who was a Queen's University mining engineering student originally from Afghanistan. He was hired as a translator for Peter Kemp, one of the defense lawyers, and was also directing his own private investigation on the side. He began visiting Shafia in jail, and after speaking to both Mohammed and Tuba, Haiti became convinced that the cops had it all wrong. Hadi wanted to have access to all the police and Crown evidence to that point in the investigation. He wanted the police interrogations and interviews and wiretaps, which is ridiculous considering he had no qualifications. But Hadi was handed the files. This also indirectly gave Shafia access to the Crown's evidence against him and his family. Hadi was obsessed with the case and was convinced that the police were being given wrong interpretations of Shafia's statements and taped conversations and thought the Crown's case was biased. On November 7, 2009, Hadi brought his laptop to the jail and recorded his interview he had conducted with Hamid. Apparently, he told the Shafias that the recording he made of their interviews would stay with him alone. However, they didn't and he decided that what Hamid had to say was so favorable to Shafia's case that police should hear it too. But on November 16th, Hadi and his recordings appeared in court, not as a witness for the Shafias, but for the prosecution, which had subpoenaed him to testify. In the recording, Hamid revealed much more than he did to Sergeant Boyles. He told Hadi that both cars arrived at the motel and that Zainab and the others were inside the Nissan, itching to buy some phone cards. Apparently, Hamid advised against it, but agreed to follow them in the Lexus, just to make sure they made it back from the gas station. The pumps were closed, and while looking for a place to turn around, he said he accidentally rear-ended the Nissan. And while picking up the broken pieces of headlight, he heard a splash. So, Hamid did what any good brother would do. He beeped his horn, dangled a rope in the water, 
and left for Montreal to stage a cover-up accident. The Shafia trial would take place at the Frontenac County Courthouse, which required some specialized upgrades. The large courtroom on the second floor was rewired to include flat-screen televisions and a pair of rectangular soundproof booths reserved for interpreters. Every word of the trial was translated in real time through headphones to five different languages. Dari, Farsi, English, French, and Spanish. On most days, the gallery was so full that there weren't enough headsets to go around. Representing the Crown's case were attorneys Lori LaSalle and Gerard Lahui. The prosecution delivered their opening address on October 20th, 2011, two days before what should have been Sahar's 20th birthday. There were photos of the girls on the screens, and Lori LaSalle told the jury of five men and seven women that the killings were motivated by honor based on cultural influences Shafia had brought with him from the Middle East and carried out with the full cooperation of his preferred wife and son. Each of the accused had their own lawyer. Mohammed was being defended by Peter Kemp, Tuba was being defended by David Crown, and Hamid was being defended by Patrick McCann. In Canada, the burden is on the Crown to prove guilt. People are presumed innocent until convicted. But all three of the accused came across as either completely oblivious to the charges or arrogant. It was like they truly believed they had done nothing wrong. With each day of testimony, the evidence became more obvious. Teachers, social workers, and police testified about the abuse and dysfunction within the Shafia household. In hindsight, the cries for help from the girls were clearly underestimated. Each day, pictures of the girls were on monitors in the courtroom. Sahar taking selfies, Zainab with her hoop earrings, and Gidi holding a puppy. In total, 50 witnesses would be called to testify over six weeks. And defense lawyers challenged barely any of it. Most of their cross-examinations finished within minutes. Sharzad Mohab was the Crown's final witness and called to testify on December 5th 2011. She was an academic from the University of Toronto, specializing in Middle Eastern honor killings. She testified that in some Middle Eastern cultures, a woman's body is the repository of the family honor, and that the family status depends on the control of female sexuality. Quote, it reflects on who is in power in the household. If a man cannot control his own household, which is represented by the behavior of female members, it means he cannot be trusted for any other public matters. There is only one way, she said, to erase that shame. Bloodshed. The prosecution rested their case, and the defense called their first witness, Mohammed Shafia. And Shafia had an explanation for everything. He lied about his true relationship with Rona because he was worried about her immigration file. His daughters were apparently allowed to fall in love so long as they didn't hide their relationship. He thought Amar Wahid was a disgraceful drunk, but if that's the man Zainab wanted, it was fine with him. And on more than one occasion, as an interpreter finished translating his answer, Shafia would look the jury up and down to analyze their reactions. In what might be described as one of the weirdest moments of the trial, Shafia's lawyer, Peter Kemp, asked him to explain what he really meant when he said, quote, may the devil shit on their graves when speaking of his dead daughters. Because apparently, phrases like that can mean a variety of different things in different cultures. And with a straight face, Shafia replied, quote, to me it means the devil would go out and check with them in their graves. If they had done a good thing, it would be good. If they had done bad, it would be up to God what to do. By the time the prosecution had finished their cross-examination, Shafia admitted he thought his daughters were whores and that they deserved to die, but he didn't murder them. Or at least he felt that way about Zainab and Sahar after seeing suggestive photographs of them after their deaths. The other two were apparently innocent. Overall, Shafia spent two days on the stand and also dismissed the wiretaps. His wife, Tuba, also took the stand in her own defense and was there for six days. Honestly, it felt like 60. That woman has a talent for talking about absolutely nothing when asked the simplest of questions. What did you do when Sahar tried to kill herself? How long did you stop at the McDonald's? What day were the funerals? 
Questions like these would trigger a rambling response about Farsi expression or motherly love or how sick and forgetful she was that night. But she did admit one thing of value to the jury, that she was a big fat liar. But now she was ready to tell the truth. Everything she told the police during her interrogation was all lies, especially the one about being at the locks with her husband and son when half the family drowned. She apparently only said what she did out of desperation, trying to escape the clutches of the police interrogator and save Hamid from torture. For the first time since the trial began, the defense strategy was clear. Blame Hamid, but not for quadruple murder, just for failing to tell anyone, including his grieving parents, that he witnessed the accident. In the end, Hamid did not testify, hoping to shield his pathetic alibi from cross-examination. The whole thing was ridiculous and insulting to the victims, but that was their story. Shafia's lawyer, Peter Kemp, was the first to give his closing address. He asked the jury to consider who his client is, a wealthy entrepreneur who traveled the world and a doting father who lived for his family. Tuba's lawyer, David Crow, said his client lived for one thing, to be a mother. And Hammond's lawyer, Peter McCann, said that his client's version of events is the only one that makes any sense. Hamid followed the girls, for their own safety, of course, and accidentally rear-ended the Nissan near the locks. And while picking up the shattered headlight pieces, he heard the car go in. According to McCann, the only thing Hamid was guilty of was making a terrible decision. Quote, he then made a terrible, terrible decision. He was 18 at the time. He was a kid. He's guilty of being stupid and morally blameworthy. Prosecutor Lori LaSalle spoke to the jury for six hours, saying that the physical evidence alone was enough to convict. Father was the ringleader of the murder. Son took care of logistics, scouting out locations and mother kept it all secret, ensuring nobody saw it coming. The jury began deliberating on January 27, 2012. It took just 15 hours of deliberation for the jurors to reach their verdict. As soon as he heard the verdict announced, Hamid covered his face with both hands. Tuba rubbed his back, and Shafia stood stone-faced looking at the jury. 58-year-old Mohammed Shafia, 42-year-old Tuba Yaya, and 21-year-old Hamid Shafia were all found guilty of first-degree murder. Looking out at the packed courtroom, Justice Maringer asked the newly convicted if they had anything to say. Shafia, never one to stay silent, said, Yes, we are not criminals, we are not murderers, and this is unjust. Tuba, as usual, was crying and said, Your Honor, this is not just. I'm not a murderer, I'm a mother. Hamid, who didn't say a single word during the trial, responded loudly, I did not drown my sisters anywhere. But Justice Maringer wasn't having it. Quote, It is difficult to conceive of a more heinous, more despicable, more honorless crime. The apparent reasons behind these cold-blooded, shameful murders was that four completely innocent victims offended your twisted notion of honor. A notion of honor that is founded on the domination and control of women. A sick notion of honor that has absolutely no place in any civilized society. Mohammed, Tuba, and Hamid were each given an automatic life sentence, with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Sadly, there would be no victim impact statements. At the end of most criminal trials, especially murder trials, relatives are given a chance to tell their story, to explain how unspeakable their loss has been. For Rona, Zainab, Sahar, and Gidi, nobody came forward to confront their killers, which is absolutely heartbreaking. In 2015, they filed appeals stating that the honor killing theory was prejudiced by the jury, but their appeal would be denied. And in 2017, Hamid tried to appeal his sentence by disputing his year of birth on his record arguing that he was actually 17 at the time of the killings, not 18, meaning he should have been tried as a young offender and received a lighter sentence. But the appeal was denied when the judge ruled that there was no merit to the application. Today, Tuba is in Joliet Institution for Women in Quebec. Hamad and Mohammed are serving their sentences in Ontario. Mohammed was originally in Kingston Penitentiary, but after it closed down, he was moved to an undisclosed location and the years in prison haven't softened Mohammed Shafia either, 
If anything, he's become more radicalized. After his first degree murder conviction in 2012, Shafia took on a religious leadership role at Kingston Penitentiary before it closed. He organized Friday prayers when the only Amman allowed to minister to inmates in Canada was not available. In 2015, a Senate committee hearing heard that Shafia has intimidated other prisoners to the point that one asked to be put in isolation. According to psychologist Robert Groves, who worked in Kingston Penitentiary, he met with one non-Muslim inmate who went out of his way to avoid Shafia. Quote, It turned out that he felt so intimidated by Shafia and some of his lieutenants that he chose to give up his relative freedom of movement on the range and in general population for a much more restricted life on the social isolation range. This man was obnoxious in manner, demanding of the Protestant and Catholic chaplains, and generally offensive. The normal pleasant atmosphere associated with the Muslims gathering for prayers was absent. Inmates on the same range as Shafia, who came to see me, expressed fear of him. He was found to be bullying more than 20 men to come to his religious readings, even men who weren't Muslim. Okay, I have to say this, prison is not a very nice place, and some of these guys are pretty scary. This man is in his 70s, hardly intimidating. Why has nobody kicked his butt yet? In 2018, the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada ruled that when Tuba and Mohammed are released from prison, they won't be allowed to stay in Canada and will be deported back to Afghanistan. In 2019, Tuba applied to the Parole Board of Canada for an escorted temporary absence from the federal penitentiary in Quebec where she is currently incarcerated. She wanted a few hours to be able to mourn at her mother's grave with her other children. Tuba told the parole board that she hated her mother for allowing her to be married to Shafia when she was only 17. She also resented the fact that her mother allowed her to marry a man who was already married to an older woman. She also told the parole board that she feels more free in prison than when she was married to Shafia. And yet, despite not being eligible for parole until 2034, and being deported back to Afghanistan after she's released, the parole board granted her this five-hour leave of absence. In their ruling, the parole board notes that Tuba has not been in touch with Shafia since she filed for divorce in 2017, although Shafia completely refused to sign the papers. Reaction from the police who sent her to prison in the first place was not positive. They were angry, to say the least. Steve Tanner, who was the chief of Kingston Police at the time of the murders, said that the parole board's decision was ridiculous. Quote, This was one of the most horrific murders that I have ever personally played a role in investigating, and there is no way that she should have received a day pass or any form of leniency. And that brings us to the end of the Shafia saga for now, or at least until 2034, when all three will face their first parole hearing. I suspect Tuba will quietly be paroled and deported since the feedback from the parole board has been positive so far. Tuba currently has a medium security classification, but is seeking transfer to a minimum security institution. As far as Hammond goes, I haven't heard anything good, but I haven't heard anything bad. I suspect depending on how he responds to prison life and based on his age at the time of his crimes, he will most likely be paroled at some point. Mohammed, though, I can't see that guy ever being released, but one never knows with the Parole Board of Canada. Thank you so much for watching and taking the time to hang out with me today. If you enjoyed learning about this case, please be sure to like and subscribe. If you have a case you would like me to cover for a future video, let me know down below in the comments section. To support my channel, go to Buy Me A Coffee if you would like to donate. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.